Alright, welcome to another episode of the Altered Attitudes podcast, where we share stories, insight and support to inspire positive change in the lives of those seeking recovery. Today's episode is brought to you by Rehabs UK, your partner on the journey towards recovery. We're about to dive into a timely and crucial topic that's currently making headlines across the UK. The UK's first official consumption room for illegal drugs, including heroin and cocaine, and it's been re- it's been re- received it has received approval in fact by authorities in Glasgow. To help us dissect this pivotal and quite frankly controversial development, we're joined today by Lester Morse, managing director of Rehabs UK. Morning, Lester. Hello. Lester, your wealth of knowledge and uh, indeed your opinion is always appreciated, so thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm your host, Matt, and together with Lester today, we're going to explore the significance of this initiative, uh, its potential impact on individuals, families, communities, and the broader conversation surrounding drug addiction, harm reduction, and the path to recovery. So before we dive in, it's just a quick reminder to please hit that subscribe button and share this episode with friends, family or anyone who you think should be a part of this conversation because your your help there truly makes a massive difference. Now, let's get into this pilot scheme we're discussing. It's located in Glasgow's East End and supported by the Scottish Government as a proactive response to the drug death crisis. The Scottish Government is funding the initiative with an initial three-year commitment and allocating a budget of £7 million to support the initiative. So we'll see how far those funds can go. And and of course, three years seem like a substantial duration, especially in terms of recovery. It's worth noting that it's a relatively short time. But, you know, as governments are, it's sort of four-year cycles. So without further ado, let's dive into the discussion with yourself, Lester. Thank you for joining us once again. So with your extensive experience and, you know, in the addiction field, what's it been over 25 years working in addiction and, and even longer than that in recovery? I imagine this is a topic that's come before and uh, it's pretty clear that on the face of it, providing somewhere safe for consumption rooms or for consuming alcohol and, and drug, hard drugs will prevent deaths from things like dirty needles and potentially overdose. So on the face of it, that's obviously a, that's, that's a brilliant thing, right? We, we all want less deaths. But what does this form of harm minimization mean for long-term addiction recovery especially on like a nationwide scale like that like it's obviously you, you, you have individuals and the government are kind of looking at this the, these figures as like a huge uh, as one big thing you know it's not as, as necessarily as individuals so so yeah what does this sort of um what, what does it mean for long-term recovery having these consumption rooms is it a better al- is there a better alternative <coughs> oh blimey um Again, just to make it easier for myself or be easy on mm. me, is that you know I don't think there is a answer, and I think that's the problem with um, these sort of discussions and giving opinions on this, mm. on these sort of subjects is it's quite heavily debated, and it's it's a it's an uncomfortable debate as well because um, you know yeah. it definitely seems around the world when you listen to the debates there's two very strong um, voices and you know one of the voices is harm minimalization um, Mm -hmm. which is a a whole philosophy and and, and consumption rooms would just be a part of that they wouldn't be the whole the whole thing and then on the other hand you have the abstinence base which is mostly coming from things like the 12 step movement and they really are like the the harm minimalization are like the catholics because they're sort of state funded and they're the mainstream and then you get the uh the protestants are like the the um the abstinent based guys which is what i'm one of them that are unfunded and uh sort of got a little bit more of a spiritual, some people say religious um, process. So then, they, they should. I, I would think they should be hand in hand because again, I think they are kind of different. One should lead to the other, and um, <clears throat> don't know whether that's always the case. And again. Um, but this is too oh, very Lester, we're camp. losing you a little no. bit there. Have you uh, moved away from your microphone a little bit? No. 
No, that sounds there? better. Yeah, just keep keep yourself nice and close to that. Yeah, keep yourself nice and close to that mic. Yeah, I didn't move away. Um, well, I'll I'll, I'll put. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll put the question sort of. I'll pose it just slightly, slightly differently because I understand it's really it is just a really complicated question and there's not really a right answer to it. So you know this really is opinion based. Um, but with your experience, I appreciate you got some pretty pretty strong and pretty well educated opinions in there. So really, you know, are these consumption rooms like? A, could it be considered a prelude to absence based recovery? Recovery, you know, is this something that could come before absence based okay, recovery, not, uh, or does this way again, of thinking think just completely fly in the face of that? Yeah, but that's the trouble, too, Matt. Is like uh, there isn't a answer. There's lots of different mm. answers, for different people at different times, and it kind of even, yeah. you know, again, that's why I find this conversation so difficult because. It's like two different poles. I think anyone will tell you this. You know, you, you'd only have to... And again, it's probably a discussion that needs to be had a lot more often. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's... You know, when you're talking about one thing, it's like you're against another. And then they... they but I think the danger of that is, is that they try and then say, right, who's right? And let's make that... The, the 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 process that everybody gets offered now for some people that's going to consign them to a life of drug addiction some of them people mm. could become abstinent with the right support some people probably not going to become abstinent ever now that's either going to be because they can't for some emotional or mental disorder who knows or well, they may just not want to, which seems quite often the case. And then how do you oppose yeah. abstinence on someone that doesn't want to? So it's like, it makes it hard to give an answer. But I do fly the flag for recovery, abstinence-based. But it doesn't, you know, that doesn't think that I mean for a minute that I believe everybody's able to get um, free from drugs. I mean, I think everybody's able, if I'm honest, given the right support, I just don't think everybody wants to. And I think even mm -hmm. some of them that don't want to are not able because their drug-soaked brains won't allow them to make that choice. Or they've developed in a way that they're mm -hmm. not willing to, to face themselves. I've been in abstinence-based recovery for 33 years. It's not easy. It literally isn't easy, it's difficult, and you really have to be dedicated to it. You really have to be... Um, I just don't ever want to live my life as a drug addict or an alcoholic. I just don't want that for myself. And so the only way so I can So do you think the chances of somebody finding... Sorry, Lester, do you think the chances of somebody finding abstinence are reduced if, if they participate in something like a consumption room? I think people's chances of finding abstinence are reduced if they're on drugs of any kind. <laughs> Very true. And that's the trouble, because it's mind-altering substances. I think people's minds are altered. that they, It's not even possible for them to make a decision like that without a lot of interference and support around them or you know um what do we call it uh, intervention you know some people and they mm -hmm. given a lot of intervention and clear their minds they make different choices but but then their minds will go up and down up and down because their their brain's struggling to re um ground itself out and so i think you know I don't think people are given the opportunity to um, have, be abstinent, even when they send them to rehabs. It's, you know, it's just not a given that somebody's going to go to a rehab because they're going to become abstinent. It's a difficult journey, and I don't often see a lot of support. But, <clears throat> but some of the things that I do think that I think I'd like to say from flying the flag from abstinent is that. There's no doubt, and again, look, I always think, you know, when I'm talking about addiction, I think I sound like a fanatic, but it has been my whole life. You know, from being in addiction for 12 years myself, 
being in recovery for 33 years and being surrounded by it, you know, I, I, I try not to be biased, but, you know, obviously uh, we have our biases, we all do, and things that I believe and things that I don't. But, but so correct me, Matt, from your point of view, if you think that what I'm saying is unreasonable, but, you know, Scotland's being given permission for these consumption rooms because it's, they're desperate. That's yeah. fair to say, do you not think? It's a desperate situation. Yeah, I mean, the death, death rate death rates there they, they took an ever so slight dip i think last year and now they're you know they're back up to an all-time high it seems to be kind of ever going uh, and it doesn't seem to be no. like there's there's much of a solution to it people are scrambling for one so the old adage of desperate situations create desperate measures this is a desperate measure yeah, so, absolutely. You know, I don't know if a desperate measure is a good thing. It's a good thing if you're in a desperate situation. But then I think, well, how did they end up in this desperate situation? When, as far as I can tell, for the last, you know, when I started my journey and when I started trying to help people, which is part of my program, in um, probably about 90 in the early 90s, I probably come back to England in about 94, something like that, there was no local drug and alcohol agencies. It wasn't being funded at that point. And then I don't know the exact year, but at some point, all of a sudden, we used to have to take people to the doctors and he would give you prescriptions for, for methadone or he'd give you prescriptions for... Um, uh, what was it, Librium, to help people detox, and then you'd kind of spend a bit of time helping them detox. And then all of a sudden, the doctor said, no, you've got to go to these local drug and alcohol agencies, which were very much harm minimalization. Mm -hmm. And it drove us crazy, because we were like, they're telling people to have drink diaries, they're trying to help them control their drinking. Now again, for some people that aren't alcoholics, that, that's probably possible. If you can control your drink, and if you can stop or moderate, then you're not an alcoholic addict or an addict. And so that started, but it used to drive us nuts because we were all abstinent, thinking that people should stop taking drugs, stop drinking, that was the goal. But then, so all of these agencies started to get funded all over the country by the government, and they ring-fenced funding for them, and they were under the, the uh, administration of the NTA, the National Treatment Association. There's this whole new system started to happen. Now, personally, I think since that started, the death rate has been rising. That, that's my opinion. Again, I'm not in control of the statistics. The NTA, after about 16 years, switched to Public Health England. And I think, personally, because they were falsifying statistics but again it's only what I picked up on little bits of leaks that were leaked out that they were ticking boxes to make it sound like everything was going good but it was getting worse the prisons were getting worse everything was getting worse because they were doing this harm minimization yeah. so but at the same time now this is the bit I really want to point out because again I don't know if it's true it'd be nice if somebody actually did um, some investigative journalism on it and have a good look but but England started also at that point started spending a lot more money on putting people in rehab and rehab started to grow and in the rehabs most rehabs were doing 12 step recovery which abstinence people love and harm minimalisation don't love they almost seem like you're completely enemies to each other for some reason. That's the sort of the environment that's been set or that exists, that they are opposing. But the harm minimalization were getting all of the funding, but they were using some of that. Now, you can't fund 12-step directly, which is where recovery comes from. The recovery, I believe, in abstinence recovery pretty much comes from 12-step. 
but you can't fund that. You can't give money to AA. AA, if if the government went AA, we're going to give you hundred billion pounds. AA would say no, thank you. We can't. If they said AA, we're going to give you a pound, they'd say no, thank you. AA is self-supporting for its own contributions. You cannot fund it. So you can't fund recovery even if you wanted to. Which is a problem for governments. It was a problem for us, to give you an idea mate, I used to go into um, the local prison for about 10 years. And we had, I'd go to all of the meetings that they had in the prison to sort of, you know, talk about our groups. And they'd often say, look, you guys don't even take expenses. Let us give you expenses because we believe that we're self-supporting. We weren't allowed to take any money if we were going there representing AI. So we refused our expenses. And then they said, look, how can we fund your, can we fund your organisation? We, we see that you bring something. In actual fact, they were going to close down the, um, the induction part of... Um, there's a lot of cutbacks in staff, so they were trying to defund certain areas and they were talking about cutting back the uh, induction groups. It wasn't just AI, it was all multidisciplinary kind of meetings. All different kinds of people would introduce themselves at the beginning. But they were going to cut that. Mm -hmm. But... Um, the chaplain and some of the prison guards that looked after the chaplaincy centre said this in the meeting. They said, look, I think we should keep funding that because even if it's only to let them people in recovery talk to the prisoners because they noticed there was a tangible difference when we talked. And, and they said this, they said, look, when these guys from the 12-step fellowship talk to the prisoners, they get a 95% concentration. They said they just don't see that anywhere else, that these guys listen when them people talk. Which, again, is kind of what our whole philosophy is kind of founded on. Nothing equals one alcoholic or addict talking to another with a purpose of recovery, because probably 80% of them had drug and alcohol problems, when we were talking, they were relating. And anyway, yeah. what I'd, what we'd notice, we'd spend a lot of energy um, building in our um, programs and building some groups up, which make it work. But whenever we built up a decent group, for some reason, the prison would cut our ability to go in there for always five weeks. I don't even know why, but... And after five weeks, it kind of destroyed the foundation that we built up. So I used to say to them, look, you can't fund us directly, but would you be willing to put a pot of money aside and then spend it on a prison guard so you don't keep shutting our groups down? Which never happened, but mm -hmm. that was just to give you an idea of sort of what you're dealing with. And I so... An idea of how quickly it can all break down as well. Well, again, when you understand the process of recovery, which most people don't, and, and, you know, it takes a bit of time to explain to people, and this is just through my experience. See, I come into a recovery group, and that group supported me. That group was there for me. That group was there for me seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That group of people were there for me. At three in the morning when I'm having panic attacks and I'm climbing the walls and I want to use, I pick up the phone and somebody's going to drive to my house and sit and drink coffee with me. When I'm struggling for work, someone's going to help me find some work. When I had nowhere to live, they let me stay on their couch. That is a massive resource in my life and I needed it. I needed that amount of support. They don't give you that amount of support in the local authorities. They can't give you that amount of support in the local authorities. It's the, this problem's never going to be solved by professionals. Look, even look at the most professionals, they look like drug addicts now and alcoholics. Because mostly they are. In England, 50% of them. But where did that 50% of recovered people that fill these services come from? 
from the 12 step fellowships, from the rehabs. See, so in England, they funded a lot of rehab places, which built up a lot of recovery. Because you can't fund recovery directly. This is an important point. You can't fund recovery directly. But the rehabs, you, by funding the rehabs, you were funding recovery. Because they were training the people, helping the people, getting them into the local meetings, building up the recovery capita in the community. And it was them people. See, when you're actually in the middle of it, because again, twice in two different cities, I was the catalyst that that all built around. That I provided the environment for people to come and eat, come do groups, come do um, social events, parties, music, holidays, going to the cinema. We created this whole community. And then the people in that community were bringing the other people that were behind them in the community. So in England, England built up, through funding the rehabs, a lot of recovery. Abstinence recovery. Mm, makes and sense. Again, in that abstinence recovery, people are relapsing, they're struggling, they're, you know, it's all going on. Addiction's messy business, man. But it all happened. Mm -hmm. But you had this massive community that was supporting everyone in the area. Sorry, mate, he's going to speak then. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it totally makes sense. I mean, humans just generally, they want to be around people. They want a community, don't they? And if you don't provide a healthy community for them, they're going to go to whatever community is available. Uh, and if you're in already in the world of, of drug and alcohol and, you know, I'm sure most people that, that are, you know, they drink or, or they use, there's going to be somebody else, some kind of friend or somebody out there, some community that they can quite easily crawl back to. Uh, so without providing something else for them to really just to do then uh, they're, they're going to find their way back there in no time mate you can't beat it honestly you, you can't beat that and it, it but it's also develops naturally look literally when you've got ed like mine again remember I, the, the drugs and the, the alcohol is just the self-medicating. It's the mental condition that you've got that's being made worse by the drugs and alcohol, which is why I believe in abstinence, because the drugs and alcohol, whether they're prescription or... They're making you worse, and you're getting worse. Look, you, you know, again, it's like everything in our society at the minute. It's like, well, smoking's really bad, but vaping's better. Well, it's not good. It's just not as bad as smoking. So again, you can say things look good, but they're not good. They're just better than worse. And people seem happy in that for some reason. But people get worse in drug addiction. And so even if you bring them up to a reasonable level, they're still going to get worse as time goes by because you're just medicating a mental condition that's getting worse and the drugs are making it get worse. So... You know, without the ability... It, see, it wasn't the 12-step program, which I love, and is fantastic, and everyone should learn how to do it properly, that kept me sober. It was the fellowship. Because, again, mate, I have so many issues. You know, I've only got to get a resentment, and my personality changes completely. It's like, I, it's like I'm still jackal and eyed. And I'm very sensitive, so it don't take much to trigger me, even getting involved in these conversations, doing podcasts. Honestly, it's taking a lot of courage. I have to find a lot of courage to do this. It's just a belief to some people what I'm saying is important. To other people, I'm just talking a load of shit. But to some people, <laughs> what I'm saying, it really helps them. <laughs> well... It's just why it is, and and, and again, but I, but I believe in recovery, and again, it's not, you know, like we used to say. Look, you can't be too stupid to get this. You can be too clever, 
And so again, it's like I'm not trying to be too clever. I'm just trying to share my experience, strength and hope. It's very difficult. It's just very difficult. But to give you an example, one of the guys um, who's like a real miracle, that he's been in recovery for a, a little period of time, but um, he, he's just had tragic event after tragic, tragic event. And, you know, over the the weekend, his 17-year-old son died of a, a seizure in his sleep while he was in his care. And I don't know if you can have a more tragic event than that. So, but he's then surrounded by people in recovery. That they're around his house, you know, because again, you get quite isolated as, a, as an addict. And there isn't enough people to help you. But as soon as you come in recovery, see, they used to say this, you know, we're going to love you till you love yourself. And you feel a part of something. And then you find a few people that become your support network. And without that support network, I just don't think you, you're going to make it. And again, I just don't think that happens as good in a professional setting. It's, it's just not, you know, it's just not, they're just not able to offer that. And so I think recovery works <laughs> second to none because of the alcoholics and addicts helping the alcoholics and addicts because they're there yeah. for each other all the time. And see, so in England, they funded a lot of rehabs through that period. So there's a lot of recovery in England. But Scotland never had that. See, Scotland never had a lot of rehabs. Scotland seemed to be really sold out on the harm minimalization. And so I think that's why their death rate has gone so high, because they've got so little recovery. Not just because everybody's abstinent, because there's not a lot... I mean, look, there's some great groups in Scotland. Don't get me wrong, mate. The fellowship is brilliant. I've been to CA meetings in AA meetings in Glasgow. They're fantastic people, and they're doing everything they can to help as many people. And if you went... Um, to Scotland, you'd find a lot of heroin addicts, cocaine addicts, crack addicts in recovery doing fantastic and helping a lot of other people. But they're not getting any support. See, when you put rehabs in the area, it starts filling their meetings up. It starts filling up the... I should think even... Around Suffolk, most of the services have got people that come through the rehabs working in them. And they're not allowed to, to tell you too much about that, which seems strange. So I think my big point is, is that that harm minimalisation on its own is going to lead to higher death rates. You will have lower HIV, you will have lower hepatitis, and when they start giving people clean drugs and needles and have someone standing next to them, you will have lower death rates. But you won't have higher recovery rates. Because there's not a lot of recovery in it. You've got to get the recovery and the harm minimalization working together. Mm hmm because I don't see recovery in harm minimalization. You know, some of the great things of harm minimalization is like in Liverpool and things like that, I think it was Liverpool, where they had such a high amount of HIV spreading hepatitis that they started giving clean needles. Now clean needles is part of the harm minimalization. You're not stopping people using drugs, but you're making it safer for them. And I mean, it, to deal with the health issues of addicts, it was fantastic. It brought down all of them issues that having dirty works were causing. But it doesn't treat the addiction. It treats the harms of addiction. And so it can make a drug mm. addict be in a better condition. And again, of course, if you're alive, you've got more chance of getting 
sober at some point but if you haven't got recovery as part of the process then you're not going to get a lot of recovery and again mm-hmm. I think Scotland so we're sort of hoping mm. so you know we're kind of hoping that there is some recovery solutions alongside these consumption rooms but of course we don't know so you know what would be maybe not perhaps a better alternative to the rooms but you know if you could suggest maybe what what could accompany these rooms to aid recovery because as you mentioned at the start of the podcast you know the uh, it's all it's good to minimize harm but without recovery it's like we're not actually treating the root cause of the problem so if we could do both what, what what might that look like that would look like the catholics funding the protestants <laughs> What 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 have the countries done? It, 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 I think the death rates are going to rise in England, which they are anyway, because they've stopped funding rehabs. Mm-hmm. They've even changed the name of recovery. Recovery was mostly 12-step abstinent base. At least that was the goal. They changed the word recovery because I think in 2015, the government said they've got to start doing recovery. They just changed the words. They, they've told, they've stolen our word recovery, and they've put it into any. You, you could be using all kinds of drugs and be in recovery. And they've stopped funding the harm minimisation organisations are getting all of the funding. The only funding recovery got was through twelve step rehabs. So start funding 12-step rehabs. And you'll see people getting their chance of getting abstinent. But mostly what you'll see is the community filling up with people in recovery. And they're your recovery capita. They're the ones that are going to bring the death rate down and do most of the work. I mean, look, a lot of them people don't even stay in 12-step fellowship. They go over to harm minimalization. They go over to all different things. But I think that they need to Mm -hmm. fund 12-step rehabs. You can't fund 12-step directly. You have to fund it indirectly through funding 12-step rehabs. Look, private rehabs aren't the same because people only stay there for short periods of time and go home. You need the long-term rehabs. Because it starts at home that might not know the difference. Could you perhaps, could could you just explain a little bit the difference perhaps between a a private rehab and and the 12-step rehab that you're referring to? Well, I think the private rehabs, that they were, not that they're not good, but they were just um, mostly people would go there you know if you could fund yourself you usually got a bit of money so they were probably only going there for short periods of time and then they go back to their place of origin which again I think is one of the Mm -hmm. things that's happened in Scotland that because they were sending people to rehab and they would say that we send X amount of people to rehab but in different parts of the country or mostly in England So you don't get that community grow around. You know, what you need is a 12-step rehab in the heart of Glasgow. And then you need to leave it alone and let it grow. And it'll start pumping out Mm -hmm. a lot of people in recovery. You'll get more AA meetings, you'll get better AA meetings. You'll get more people going out, helping people, picking them up, dropping them off, running them around, lending them money, giving them some dinner, taking them some naloxone, dropping them off here, picking them up there. You'll get more voluntaries in all your services because you're getting, you know, 12-step rehabs that give people long-term, they're like recovery colleges. That's what I've observed twice in my life. But, look, there was five rehabs in Norfolk and Suffolk. There's none now. The recovery in England is going to start sliding backwards because it's being zero-funded. 
because it was funding the rehabs that was creating the population for them communities, which is unequal. But you're just trying to get people to see that. See, you think people coming in rehabs are just being taken off drugs. They're not. They're starting to populate a community that when that community grows, they give unequal support for free. It doesn't cost the government a penny once you get to that point. So saying spending a grand a week putting them in a rehab is expensive is like, man, well, you're getting back. Even Dame Black's report said every pound they give somebody like me, the country gets a four pound return. I think that's a gross underestimation. Because what we do is generational. But hey, mate, if I give someone a pound and they give me four pound back, I'll take that deal all day long. Well, my question <laughs> is, is, why did they stop giving the pound? Why did they stop giving the fucking pound? Because they're insane and they don't respect, appreciate the value that 12-step rehabs bring. Because you feel like you're under attack all the time because you're not harm minimalization. Why are we being pitted against each other? We're both important parts of the process. But recovery's losing the battle. Because harm minimalization is getting all the funding and now they've defunded treatment centers. They've defunded recovery. They've, they've, they've cut it off at the throat. Scotland never had it. That's why they got our death rates. No, that's just my opinion based on my experience. I found, you know, I've had a good experience in 12-step recovery, not just as a member, but as somebody that run a rehab and projects for quite a lot of years. And I could see the good that come from it in a very difficult environment. But I never felt valued. Even though they could see the good that was coming from our project. We certainly weren't being protected. And when they cut the funding, they cut our throats. We lost 50% mm -hmm. of our funding overnight. How can you... I mean, pretty much that was the end of government-funded rehabs. We started all heading to the private sector because it's the only way we could survive. But they pretty much pressurised us and cut our throats because they're such idiots mm. who haven't got a clue what they're doing. And I'm saying that because I'm feeling really angry now because <laughs> I feel really hurt and disappointed by this country, what they've done. And it just plays into yeah. the hand. Let's make, let everything get desperate and then let's do desperate measures. And again, of course, giving people drugs and standing next to them while they're taking them, that is going to bring the death rates down without a doubt. I mean, no doubt in my mind, they're going to be going in three years. This is an incredible success. The death rates have come down. <clears throat> but recovery rates aren't going to go up. Yeah, what's the generational impact of that? Well, again, recovery is a thing. It's something I know that you have to fight for. The prison system I worked in didn't get it. They just kept stamping it out because they didn't understand what made it work. What made it work was the, the, the substitute for addiction is fellowship. But they kept destroying the fellowship. That's what they did to me. I built up an incredible um, community. But then they just ripped the carpet from under you because they don't value it. And they don't value how difficult or respect how difficult it is to build something like that. And, you know, they, they could see the benefits from it were vast. And everybody could that had the look. But now you've got these... The pitted harm minimalization and recovery are kind of like opposite things. And, and then you're battling with each other. It seems ridiculous. 
It's like, who's creating mm. this environment? And, you know, you think you'd look at what's working. Well, they keep funding what doesn't work. So they're just moving on to the next level. And next it would be, look, we've got all these people coming in our consumption rooms. They've got fentanyl in their drugs. Can we not just give them clean drugs? Makes absolute sense. Is it good or not? Well, it's desperate, isn't it? Most people on drugs are desperate. It's kind of what helps make mm -hmm. recovery work. Desperation, we call it a gift. We call, we call desperation a gift. They, they give you drugs for it. Again, not against it, but it's not the silver bullet. I'm not saying abstinence is. And again, I know there isn't a answer, but I've seen the reality of both. And I don't think recovery is being given anywhere near enough support. And I think, again, I think Scotland is in the state it's in because it's not valued recovery, it's valued harm minimalisation. But do your own research, tell me what you think. <laughs> I know I know mm. what the minimalization yeah. people are gonna think about what I'm saying. They're gonna think I'm an idiot and don't know what I'm talking about. And I know what the recovery people are gonna agree with me and think they're idiots. And and again I don't think it should be like that. I think I think we should acknowledge the good that both philosophies do, but neither one will do very well on its own. But if I had to choose one, I'm going 12 step. One, free from the government's interference, which is always a good thing. It's self-funding, which makes it free from the government's interference, which is a good thing. It's run by um, service users, not by the government, which I think is a good thing. And anything that gets away from the government is a good thing, as far as I can tell because the government pretty much make everything hard and expensive and ultimately fail. But that might just be because I'm a frustrated, bitter old man now. But there you go, I've had a wonderful <laughs> career. Well, uh, you know, the night... No, well, the nice thing about these platforms is, you know, we will be uploading this to YouTube. There is a comment section and hopefully there is a forum for some discussion there because, you know, what, if, if anything, what we want to do is kind of break this tribalism one way or the other because I think, like you say, it all comes down to everybody trying to work together and trying to grow a better understanding of that. Um, it always seems like an uphill struggle when governments and funding is concerned, but if we can at least create a bit of a forum for discussion within our little community here, then I think we're doing a good thing yeah all right mate i think that's uh, enough for me today <laughs> all right well thank you so much for your time lester <laughs>